Hello and welcome to this latest episode of Marlow Meets. Today I'm going to be joined very shortly by my friend Tracy Chalk, who's also known as the British Mother. Um, Tracy is a creative, she's an educator, she's a wife and a mother to three children. And she's also the founder of a new conscious brand called Children of the Deep. I have a podcast called Sharing Tales, which invites my guests to come on and talk about some of the, the big chapters in their lives and things that have happened that have had a, a real impact upon them. And so inevitably, we often end up talking about childhood. Um, and Tracy is my guest on this week's episode on Sharing Tales. So if you'd like to go and, and listen to the full episode, Sharing Tales is available now on all podcast platforms. Um, but I'm inviting Tracy here just now to, so we can chat live and, and pick up on some of those themes and, and generally have a bit of a conversation about what she's up to. So I'm going to invite Tracy to join me now. And hopefully she'll be with us in just a moment. Hello. <laughs> Hello. There you are. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How's your day going? It's pretty good. I've had I've got rid of one of my children to football and the other two are doing some netball later. So it's hopefully everything's getting back to normal good i'm just wondering if we're having i i managed to turn off my phone so that was a really good start but i think we're we're synced back again um so i was just saying tracy how you came on sharing tales podcast and uh your episode is now live and out in the world have you had a chance to listen yeah, I did. It's really weird to listen back to your own voice talking um, and obviously how things get edited down a little bit. But yeah, no, I really enjoyed listening back. It's almost a little bit cathartic to go through experiences that you've talked about and to realise kind of how far you've come from being a child to, you know, full adulthood. Definitely. Now, a lot of you use the word cathartic and a lot of my guests definitely say that, that it can almost feel... It can feel like a therapy or oftentimes it can be the first time people are talking about some of these things in, in that kind of forum. Um, and I really wanted to create a, a safe space and a, a nice platform for people to share their stories in that way. Um, and so because of that experience we had together with the podcast, and, and we did talk a bit about your childhood, I thought it would be really lovely to have you on here in this, this happy Marlow space. Um, so we can maybe just chat a, a bit more about some of those, the things that came up. Um, and so I wondered if you'd be happy to talk a bit about what happened when you were younger and you know, the passing of your mum and how you, you coped with that and some of the support that you had at that time. Yeah, I mean, like I said uh, um, to you before, I, I don't really remember like my teenage years being any different. I just remember um, not with any real great sadness, but just that we lived with um, my mum and my sister and that my mum spent a lot of the time in and out of hospital or was poorly or was unwell. Um, and she died when I was 15. And yeah, that kind of is a real great shock to like a teenager's life to kind of get to that point and then realize you're without somebody who you've relied on so heavily throughout your life um but I'd had a probably quite a long time to get used to the fact that she was poorly and I do think um that probably helps people in, in their journey of acceptance. But she went to this amazing um, hospice called Farley Hospice in um, Chelmsford. And they were fantastic at looking after her, at looking after the family, at bringing us all in, at kind of bringing us together. And obviously when you go into a hospice for a lot of people, it is really end of life situation. So you've got these specialist team of people that are there to deal and help everybody involved. Um, 
And after she passed, one of the ladies called Liz, and I don't think she's there anymore, um, invited me to come in and speak to her and said, hey, do you want to come in and talk to me and, um, yeah, talk about your mum or talk about anything you want to? want to. And I didn't really think about it at the time as like any kind of therapy. I just thought it was mm. part of the process of something that happens. And so, yeah, I probably spent about six months with her, um, just really kind of going through events that had happened, going through my experience, going through the experience of then having to live with a different parent who I hadn't lived with before. Yeah. Um, and talk about her family, really, as well, because I think I got a lot of benefit from listening to her stories and her family and her teenage daughters and her husband. And, you know, it was like this sharing but with another adult of our experiences, but she obviously was doing it in a way that was beneficial to me. And I was just kind of there thinking, this is a great experience to get to talk through all the things that I wouldn't necessarily talk to one of my peers with. I wouldn't have yeah. said to a 15 year old um, girl at school, oh God, this is what I'm thinking at the moment. And obviously my friends are amazing, but they're not, they're not trained to, um, they're not trained to deal with somebody who's going through grief or mm. going through like a journey. Um, and I think they just kind of, your, what your friends do at the time, if you've got good friends is they're there for you to kind of carry on that normality in yeah. life. Yeah. Um, but I think if you never take a step back and actually deal with things that have happened to you, then I think they sit underneath and they stay with you for a long, much longer time. Mm. Um, and I think I, I've, felt the process quite freeing and I was able to kind of move on with a real positivity and you know the ability to see the world in a different way really yeah when we spoke before it really struck me it how positive it was that you had that resource that you had that lady that you're able to speak to and that you're almost like as you said oblivious to it being any kind of structured therapy but yeah. then it really supported you in, in processing, processing what had happened. And one of the things that kind of strikes me, particularly for young people now, um, is that it can often be hard for that kind of support to be accessed or, or for parents to know what to do. And as a mother of three children yourself, I wondered, what's your kind of thought on what's going on with children's emotional well-being and particularly in the aftermath of, of this past year? What do you think we could all be doing better as, as members of society? It's not just parents. It's kind of, I feel all of us have a role. Yeah, today. I think that's such a hard question, isn't it? Because there's probably things that we could be doing whether or not we're in a pandemic or not. Mm. Um, I think for children, and especially in terms of school, there's been such a range of how schools have dealt with um, of the children themselves is I think, again, it's about taking a step back and realising that the education is really important for them. But if their mental health isn't there, there's yeah. no point in pushing something that um, is almost secondary to their well-being, mm -hmm. that if your kids are having a bad day um, or of having a bad period in their life, their school is not. Um, you know, like the education side, the learning side comes secondary to their yeah. kind of internal health. Um, but I mean, hope, you know, the kids are back in school and it is changing, but I think it's, it's still there. So many of them have not really had school for a year, have not really had that process of being away from their friends and now kind of launched back in. Yeah. Um, and I think for adults, actually, it's quite scary coming up this weekend and the next few weekends because people are really excited to see other people again, mm. but there's that, this element of fear, like they're quite scared. Like I've got to go and socialize. Yeah. And we've kind of thrown the kids back into school. And I think they're probably the first people that have had to deal with that. They've kind of had to have that um, happiness to be going back. And then the scared aspect of, mm. um, you know, oh God, what's gonna have changed and how is this gonna be different? And can I remember how to talk to friends again? And, yeah. you know, um, it is a really bizarre situation. I just think it's, you've just got to be easy on yourself and you've got to be easy on, um, yeah, each other and realise that everybody's been in a totally different situation. You don't really know what's happened. People might have lost people. People's yeah. experiences could have lost their parents, could have lost jobs. Um, you know, like everybody's life, you haven't really seen into in the last year. No. Um, so I think it's just cutting everybody a bit of slack. Um 
-hmm. And in terms of deaths, I guess, I think the only thing that I feel now is that documenting not just my children's life, but my life in a way is quite important because Mm -hmm. if I ever go back to um, looking at pictures or videos or clips of my mum, I find that so important to me now. Um, And I watched a documentary a really long time ago, which was about um, mothers who knew that they were going to die and how they were preparing their children for this. And a lot of what was told to them was about making memories for them or, or putting the memories in one place for them. So making memory boxes for them, making picture albums for them, writing how you feel about things like, you know, what's your favorite color? What's your best memory? What did you, what were you like when you were 13? Because they're all the questions that you're never going to be able to ask Mm. anybody if something, you know, bad happens or, you know, life doesn't turn out how we want to. And I kind of think that's how every living person should be creating something for their own children by documenting themselves yeah. and, um, and their children. And it's like photographs. How many photographs are we in as mothers <laughs> as opposed to just Not your many. children yeah. or just your husband or your partner or, you know, just them with their cousins. How many do we actually get in? And it's such a touchy subject because people say, I don't really like myself in photos. Um, but if your kids look back in 20 years, are they going to care whether your hair was right or, um, no. you know, whether you've done your makeup? They're just going to see their mother and, and be so happy that you took that photo or you were in that video clip. Yeah. I mean, not only the, the, the thought of possibly losing someone, but memory is a funny thing in and of itself. And I'm just, I've got a book called, I'm not going to say, oh, Mum Tell Me, somewhere shelf up there called Mum Tell Me. So somebody had this idea to put together this hardback book and it leads you through different chapters of your child growing up. So you, it prompts you basically to write memories or, or things. Because I, my two-year-old, and she just had chicken pox. And I was even thinking about that. Or I want to remember to tell her, you were such a champ, you know, chicken pox was gone in a week and it, it didn't seem to phase you. And because yeah. life will go on and you don't remember those details. Um, and as it's you say, that scary. It's scary how quickly they go. And even having three, I can remember when my eldest child walked. I can't remember when my second child walked and I didn't yeah. write it down. And you, don't, you never remember things like teeth. You might remember their first teeth, roughly. Um, there's just so much you don't remember as you go on. And even yeah. phrases, the, the one of the easiest things to do is in my phone often, if they say something funny, um, I write it down in my phone and I'll just write the day. I'll write um, their name and then I'll just write what they said. There's like a random one that Seb did when he was younger and, it, and he literally said, I hate everything except for penguins. And I just remember <laughs> thinking, that's brilliant, you know, wrote it down. Yeah. Um, but I've got like a whole list of just random quotes that they say. And sometimes we just go back over the quotes and funny things that people say. Um, and that's like a real joy. If you ever have like mm. a really crappy day and you want to just remember something good you just go back through these little quotes of things that people have said and that your children have come up with and it's just like a little brightener you know Mm. it's capturing Mm. those as you said those joyful moments of childhood that can be so easily lost definitely so one of the things that's really you know kind of popular at the minute i think was this concept of conscious parenting Um, or just the the kind of concept of being conscious in all different kinds of our lives. And I was wondering, as a mum of three, what's your interpretation of conscious parenting? Um, I think it's just being in the moment. And I don't think that it's possible for people to do that all the time and constantly live in the moment. But it's kind of when you catch yourself worrying about what you're going to be doing in two weeks time or so hit up with a concern that you've got about something that's maybe not important right in that moment just to kind of bring yourself back in and say my kids are outside it's sunny it's a nice day it's a day of school you know go out and spend half an hour um talking to them or you know if they want to make clay rings go and buy them the kit to make the clay rings and you know and watch them do it and I think it's just so easy for us to get caught up in everything else that's going on 
in the wider world, in society, in our own lives, with work, with relationships, and actually just realise that if we don't live in the day that we're in, which is easier said than done, it will just go and you'll look back and realise um, that you didn't spend enough time, you know, being conscious in the day that you're living rather than yeah. worrying about two weeks you know, ahead or what you just did three weeks ago or, you know, a work mm. project that you've got on. Yes, it's that sense of being, as you said, absolutely present. And I think when I, one of the things I think about conscious parenting for me is about not being self-conscious, which also chimes with what you were saying about getting in that picture, or, you know, regardless of how you look. And I saw a mum on Instagram recently who's like, you know, I'm going to get in the swimming costume and get in the pool and have fun with my kids. And even yes, get in the swimming costume. Feel, yeah, just get exactly get in the swimming costume. Um, and I I think about that. And I think particularly having a daughter, although I, I don't think it really matters. But that sense of I almost it's my job now to put some of that stuff aside so that I can be a good model for her and not pass on my own self conscious you know yeah beliefs. Um, that can be really damaging. We're damaging for us as, as individuals. But yeah, I definitely don't want to pass on some of that stuff. Yeah. And that's really hard because it comes up the whole way through. Everybody's mm. got different things that they're concerned about. And, you know, the way we live, you know, unconsciously gets passed on to our children. But I think if you can put some of it aside, and like you said, you know, everybody is made to be able to enjoy going swimming if that's something that we you know that that you like doing but you know to to think oh no my kids are going to look at me in three years time in a swimming costume you know they're not going to care no yeah. one cares you know they will care that you never got in the water with them yes and I'm terrible for cold water I am shocking and I'm I am getting better but if the water's cold I'm literally I can't go in I can't go in um and I've been really working hard on trying to push myself mm. to make sure I get in like cold water because so often when you go away, the temperature of the pool is not up to 30 degrees or it's not, you know, yeah. the temperature of the sea is not 28 degrees. Um, so does that mean I don't go in the pool for two weeks? So although I think it's always there, it's something I've definitely been working on because I don't want them to mm. think on holidays, I literally never got in the pool because it was too yeah. cold. Um, mm. So I pick my moments and, you know, yeah, give it a go. But yeah. It's changing some of those narratives. It's like, I feel because as I said, or is just two at the minute, I feel like I've got a little bit of time with some of these things to prep. So I've been doing um, couch to 5k I'm not a runner. You know, I was the girl that walked cross country at school. And so this week was the first time I ran for 20 minutes straight. I realized in my whole life, which is quite shocking, but I want to, you know, I want to be able to run with her in a few years and that just to be normal, like not a thing. Yeah. Um, and I saw a mother and daughter in line skating the other day. I was like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. <And> I was <laughs> I, I hate ice skating, for example, but I don't want to be that mum that's just on the sidelines. And that's yeah. the thing. It's um, you know, just kind of being brave and sucking it up and I guess trying some of these things alongside our kids. Yeah. I think if you want to teach them that even if they don't like the idea of something, they've got to give it a go, then you've got to give things a go too. So mm. I really, you know, I'm sure I've like forced forced my children to go to like clubs and stuff not continuously but I said you know let's just go and see if you like it because I think for me especially as kids get older if they play sport or they do a hobby or activity um on the outside of school then I think it makes them a much more well-rounded person I think it makes them more confident I think it gets them into um working in part of a team um mm. And it keeps them out of trouble. So if you've got lots of friends in groups and sports and things like that, what you're not, mm. you know, hanging around the local yeah. town centre of a weekend. You're playing sport. You're doing something. And I remember being at school when I was younger, and you know, I definitely wasn't bullied. I don't remember any, you know, negative things like that. But there was always like a day or a week where people would pick on you, and your friends would turn their back on you, and you know, mm. wouldn't speak to you for a week or something. It was like some kiddie game that everyone played. And I remember thinking when that happened to me once, I'm okay because I've got friends on the outside. 
Yeah. I had friends in my road that I played with. I had friends at clubs that I was in that I could talk to. And so I literally grew up and as a parent, when I became a parent, I thought that's the most important thing for me to have is they don't just have children that are in their school. They have mm. friends um, who are outside of their school, who are in clubs, who are in groups, family, friends, anything, but just kind of foster those environments. So yes. they never just attach to one group of people and they've always then got choice. And if they're having a bad time with one group of people, there's always another group of people ready to kind of welcome them yes. in and say, yeah, come and hang out with us, come and talk to us, come and play with us, whatever. That's a really good idea or approach. And it also kind of mimics a bit what adult life can be like. Because we do have different friends from whether it's work or you know, maybe where you work out or whatever it might be. It is kind of, because I always remember when you have birthday parties, like, oh, who are all these different, oh, how do we know so-and-so? And so, yeah, it's, it's, I think that is a good idea to encourage that early on. Um, so we were talking about water before and getting in the pool, <laughs> which kind of, going back to that leads us nicely to talking about your new brand and children of the deep and what struck me when we were talking about that previously is that the idea almost came from you listening to your children to your daughter specifically so do you want to talk a bit about children of the deep and how that came to be and what it's all about yeah um so i've been thinking for a while about um creating something and we were on holiday or we were getting ready to go on holiday last year because we were lucky enough to drive to France when it opened up. And yeah, we got in the car and we didn't take much with us, but Kitty had had, you know, a lot of her swimwear all grown out and she was um, 13 and we were like, right, what can we find for you? And you go and look in all the places that you imagine, you know, you're going to find swimwear for teenagers. And then you get to the point where you're shopping in some of the, online big retailers that um do a lot of different variations of swimwear and we might have ordered say like 10 bikinis to come or 10 swimsuits we tried them all on and i was like this is terrible quality this is an awful cut this is an awful mm -hmm. fit and i realized that all the swimwear that was out there really was made for women but we're being put into yes. younger bodies and younger shapes um and there's there's very very few companies that make anything that is literally for that body shape kind of upwards it's always made for a woman and then it's kind of sized right. down really and that was just kind of the start and it was like the realization when I looked out that all the role models that were out there for girls were um a real mixed bag but so many of them I didn't feel chose the right things to highlight so for me you know like we're talking about sport um mm. if you try and find um positive sports or um you know famous people who've also got a sport attached to them even if it's a hobby um it's really hard to find those people it's all about what they look like as their mm. first um as their first yeah. offering and it's very hard then to see past that because all them people pick up on and all them brands pick up on is the, is the visual of somebody. And it's really put out to girls. Um, and so often it's, you know, like all the eyelashes, it's the, you know, tan, it's the nails, it's everything that they do to kind of change their look. But it's not really about who they are or what they are doing or what they yeah. like. It's like um, the Love Island phenomenon. I'm like, when did, yeah. when did bottoms stop being a thing in bikinis? <laughs> I know. And do you know what? I think that everybody should be able to wear exactly what they want to wear. And if you want your bottom hanging out, good on you. And if you want to wear your nails and put your eyelashes on, hey, go for it. Yeah. But there's an inherent beauty in being young and naturally without any of those things. So it's so you should kind of I feel like people think they need them to be to look a certain way and they yes. don't. And I think it's just trying to bring it back and say to people, um, here's some role models and here's some people who don't necessarily have to have all those things. And they're still really, um, you know, they've still got other things going on for them. And yeah. they might also be attractive at the same time. Um, but yeah, the product was really about being sustainable and ethical and I've just got to the point now where I just don't know why we're allowing companies to offer us products 
that don't have any sustainability or eco credentials that don't really care at all that are happy to you know to charge you three pound for a piece of fabric that probably means that someone in a factory is paying the price for you having that item on your clothing um so it was about kind of like trying to address that trying to address the balance where mm. people are really into fast fashion and i really just want to say you know slow down you can use what you've got rewear um you can buy new things sure because everybody loves a new product but you know think about where you're buying it from and just buy less you know um yeah i don't know it's like a whole journey there's so much to say about it um but yeah swimwear really for teens and upwards and anybody can wear it i mean i've got friends that have definitely um seen some of our samples and what i'd wear that i'd wear that and i'd be like yeah. brilliant but it's just not made for women to be sized down yes. it's made for teenagers and young women in their 20s and then people will you yeah. know wear it upwards if if they so desire um yeah, just trying to offer something else than what's already out there with a bit of um with a bit of thought that's gone into it and a bit of time and in the knowledge that when you buy something from a smaller company that's really put their time and soul and effort yeah. into it, you are buying a product that you don't really have to worry um mm. about any consequences, really. Mm. Well, I love that it's conscious and I love that it's young people first, as you said, rather than trying to, you know, kind of top down or adult fit, molding something for kids. Um, and it's really, I think it's really needed. And I'm excited to, to see what's going to happen next. So if people want to find out about Children of the Deep, where should they go, Tracy? So my website is just being built at the moment, but that will be www.childrenofthedeep.com. And I'm on Instagram at, at Children of the Deep so they can go and take a look wonderful well that brings us to a wrap this afternoon i would encourage people to go and listen to our full episode of sharing tales that's available on all podcast platforms and if you want to find out more about happy marlow you can check out happymarlow.com thank you so much tracy it's always such a pleasure to speak with you and you and i love seeing your smiley face <laughs> thank you enjoy the rest of the day and you take care bye, bye.